This is the next instalment of Cell 7. This book doesn't work in chapters, so it goes from the prologue to Cell 1. And this chapter is called News. The breaking news this morning is the shocking murder of celebrity Jackson Page. Page, who won the nation's hearts with his appearances on reality TV and his tireless charity work, was shot just metres from where I'm standing here on Croker Street in the area of the city known as the High Rises. In a bizarre twist, the culprit who stayed on the scene following the shooting has already confessed her guilt and been named by police as 16-year-old Martha Honeydew. Honeydew has since been arrested and in accordance with the seven days of justice law was this morning placed in cell one of death row. This will be a landmark case. Honeydew, at 16 years of age, is both the first teenage girl to face the death penalty and the first to be tried by our country's unique votes for all system the most democratic justice system in the world where you, the viewer, decide on the fate of the accused. We'll certainly be following what is most likely to be her final seven days very closely indeed. You can keep up to date via all, via all our usual social media portals as well as our dedicated 24 hour TV channel, An Eye for an Eye. Our show, Death is Justice, on air every evening from 6.30pm, we'll be analysing the details of this truly horrendous crime and the life of the accused, asking what could have led her to become such a cold-hearted killer. Her willingness to admit her crime may have already reserved her a place in that electric chair when public voting is calibrated and results are given in seven days but viewers do not miss your chance to vote on this historic case this is joshua decker signing off and handing you back to christina in the studio counseling martha sits at a table in the center of a room in half light her long hair has been shaved to her scalp and her clothes have been replaced by white overalls. She glances to the wall, watching the second hand of the oversized clock tick loudly onto 9.05 and then puffing out her cheeks and sighing heavily, she turns and stares out of the barred window to where a sparrow is perched in a tree, next to leaves curling and turning orange and red. A sparrow opens its beak and closes it again. Martha knows what it should sound like, but she can't hear its song. The chains around her wrists and ankles clank as she shuffles in her seat and looks to the middle-aged woman with thin blonde hair and watery blue eyes sitting opposite her. Did the guard explain who I am? The woman says, her voice warm and smooth against the chill of the room. Martha shakes her head. My name's Eve Stanton. I'm your designated counsellor. I don't need a counsellor. You might appreciate someone to talk to as it gets closer to. She pauses, rubbing at her chewed fingernails as she searches for the right word. To my execution, Martha glares at Eve as she finishes the sentence. I know I'm going to die, she says. I'm guilty. I killed him. Eve's gaze flickers and she looks away. So you say, she mutters. Why would I lie? Exactly. Why would anyone lie about something like that? Yeah. They both fall back into silence. The clock ticks. The sparrow flies from the tree. Why do I have a counsellor, Martha asks, because I'm a teenager? No, Eve replies, all prisoners do. Why? Eve crosses her fingers. Some people disagree with the death penalty, especially for teenagers. This is a, a concession for them. Something that the government put, can point to and say, yes, but look at this kind of thing that we allow. She smiles with her lips pressed together. A glimpse of the humanity some feel we have lost. Humanity? Is that what we've lost? Martha says. 
running her fingers over the stubble on her head. What do you think? Eve watches the tension on the girl's face and the worry behind her eyes, nothing matching the words she says and the attitude she gives off. It doesn't matter what I think, she replies, it's the law. What, an eye for an eye, Martha asks. Don't you agree with it? Don't you, Martha fires back. Eve gives a wry smile. I asked you first. So what? Whatever I think isn't important, is it? You tell me. Do you agree with voting on whether people live or die? No courts, no witnesses, no evidence, juries, nothing. Doesn't a system of the whole public having the right to vote mean that everyone is a juror? That they all affect the outcome? Martha rolls her eyes. Do you always answer questions with questions? Eve doesn't reply. You're just like the rest from the city, Martha says, looking away. And those who live in the avenues around it. No, you're worse because you think you're doing something worthwhile and you're not. Anyway, rules can change, can't they? I don't live in the city or the avenues, not quite. I'm more on the outskirts. Yeah, well, same thing. You don't come from the rises, do you? True. Like I said, you're just like the rest of them. She sticks her legs out as far as the change will, will allow and folds her arms across her chest. How often do I see you? she asks. Every day, Eve replies, apart from day seven. Day seven? My last day? Potentially your last day. What about visitors? No, she replies. What? None? Eve shakes her head. Outside the, conversa the conversation, the sparrow lands back in the tree, a worm in its beak. Martha watches it and then leans forward. What about a message, she whispers. Can you pass on a message for me? I can't do that, Eve replies. I'm sorry. Nobody would know. She looks around the room. There aren't any cameras in here. Nobody would see. I can't. Outside, the wind blows at the branches of the tree, pushing them against the glass as the sparrow bobs up and down. Who would it be for? Eve asks. Why do you care? You just said you wouldn't do it. Your mother is... You read my file? The chains on Martha's wrists clank against each other as she taps the folder on the table. And you know my mother's dead. Eve leans back slowly and pulls in a deep breath. I know your mother's dead, she replies gently. I'm sorry about that. I was going to say that, that as in, I was going to say that as your mother isn't with us anymore and your father ran off before you were born, who would the message be for? Who would you be writing to? Who would you be writing the message to? I have friends. Do you? She says and takes the folder from the table and opens it because it says here, and I quote, Martha was never a social girl at school. She struggled to make friends, casting herself on the outside and not making any effort to join in with her peers. That's teachers for you. They never liked me. Eve raises a finger. Although she was a very intelligent young lady and if she had applied herself, had the, had the ability to go far. If she had applied herself, Martha gives a sort of snort of derision. Is that another way of saying if she could have been asked? No, I think it's another way of saying if she'd had opportunity. They stare at each other. The clock ticks. The branches of the tree scratch away at the window. I had to drop out of school, Martha whispers, to pay the rent, you know. Eve nods. If I couldn't, if they started questioning, I didn't want to be. The air jutters in her chest and she sucks in her breath. The authorities miss the fact that you're an orphan because you were paying rent. Suppose they must have, otherwise they would have taken the flat away and made me live in one of those care institution places with all those kids. I couldn't. She rubs her hands over. She rubs her hands over her eyes and turns to the side. Eve pushes the box of tissues towards her. I understand, she says. Martha looks back with tears in her eyes. She sniffs loudly and swipes the box of tissues off the table. Bollocks, she says. You can try, but you never will. 
Minutes pass in silence. The box remains on the floor. I have a friend, Martha whispers, a good one. What was her name? Martha glances to Eve. His name, she said. It was a he, a male, a boy. She sniffs at Eve. What was his name? Eve asks. Martha turns to face Eve again. Is this confidential? She whispers, like in a doctor's. Eve nods. Of course. If I tell you something, you won't go off to the newspapers or go on that Death is Justice programme and tell them. No, Eve whispers. Or write it down. No, she replies. I promise. Martha leans across the table a little more and swallows hard. He... I met him after my mother was killed. He... The metal door behind them flies open and slams into the wall. Martha spins around as a prison guard strides in, his stomach wobbling over the top of his uniform, trousers and the buttons of his blue shirt straining. He swings a baton in his right hand. Eve stares at the guard. I said I'd call when we're done. He shrugs. Thought I heard you. No, she begins. Martha's eyes flash around the room. Are there cameras in here, she says. The guard moves closer to her. Is this recorded? Does this go out on TV? Her voice is louder and louder. I thought this was confidential. The chair grinds against the floor as she stands up and the chains clatter as she lifts her hands in desperation. You said, she says, leaning over Eve, but the guard grabs the chains and yanks her backwards and she falls to the floor, lying near his feet with him towering over her. The baton in his hand and a steer on her face, on his face. Stop, Eve shouts. Go on, Martha shouts back. Hit me. Hit a defenceless girl if you think you're one enough. The guard leers down at her. Stop it, Eve shouts. She's a killer, this one, he says. An animal. She'll be treated like one. Martha kicks out at the guard, but he pulls her sideways and her head and shoulders bang into the door frame. Martha, Eve says. Everything in here is, is confidential. I promise you that. Seagulls straining in with the story. The guard snorts. Yeah, unless I hear that. Unless I hear. Sorry. The guard snorts. Yeah. Unless I can hear it, then. Martha pulls back against the guard. For a moment, her strength catches him off balance and he lurches forward, but he heaves against the, change again, the chains again and raises the baton higher above her. Stop it! He rushes forward and takes her phone from her pocket and pointing at him. You want this in the papers, she asks, on the TV, on television? Want voters to see what it's really like in here? He stares at her. You wouldn't do that. Try me, she hisses. Bloody soft is like me, he says to Eve, dropping the baton and jabbing her in the face with the f and jabbing at her face with his finger. How is this how Bloody soft is like you, he says to Eve, dropping the baton and jabbing at her face with his finger. Or how this country got into such a mess before. Getting murderers off on some technicality. Letting paedophiles go because there wasn't enough ed evidence. Best thing we ever did was get rid of the courts. That weren't no justice. This, he points out of the door. Means to the corridor. This is justice. Death is justice. And you haven't got no place in this system with your stupid softy ideas. He shakes his head, sweat beading on his forehead. I know how I'll be voting more than once too. He drags Martha to stand in. I don't care how much it'd cost. I'd spend my whole month's wages making sure you fry, girl. If it was up to me, you'd be in that chair tomorrow. He wraps chain, the chains around his fist and pulls her to his face. How could you do it, he hisses. How could you kill Jackson Page? The man never hurt no one. Look at all them people he helped. All his charity work. He could have left this country with all that money he had, but he didn't. He stayed and helped the likes of you. He was an icon. He was a fucking liar, Martha, Martha hisses. The head but forces her backwards and he lets go of the chains. She slams into the wall and slumps to the side. Too shocked, Eve doesn't move. Did you get that, he says to her. On your phone, did you get a good shot? Because I don't give her a bloody hoot. 
go and sell it to the papers. They'll put it on the front page and I'll be hailed a hero. His cheeks puff out as he grins. They'll pay me to do it again. Martha watches as his raucous laugh wobbles his whole, face, whole body. Her face tightens. Her eyes narrow and she stands and stares up at him. She spits in his face. Before we can react, Eve grabs Martha, pulls her out of the room and into the corridor. Calm down, she shouts behind her. I'll see to this. I'll sort her out. In the corridor are six metal doors, closed but for a small panel. Some with anonymous eyes staring out. The seventh, fi the final one is at the very end, locked up and silent. What do you do, girl? A deep male voice comes from one of the cells. Spat in his ignorant face, Martha replies. The voice booms heartily. You made my day, he says. You from the rises? Come on, Eve says. You're not supposed to be talking to anyone. The guard will be out in a minute. Yeah, Eve replies to the voice. Uh-huh. What got you in here? What did a girl do that was so bad? I shot Jackson Page, she replies. No shit. No shit. Girl, you just made my year. Power to the rises, he says. And from the gap in the cell, a clenched fist appears, a tattoo of a rose down the side of his hand. Come on, Eve says, but before she can lean her forward, Martha rushes to the door and rests her hand on the man's fist. She presses her face up to the gap. What did you do, she whispers. Dark eyes peer back at her. Only thing I ever did wrong, girl, was to be born in the wrong place. Martha, move, come on quickly. Good luck, she whispers to the man and walks away. Eve pulls open the heavy cell door. You shouldn't have... The guard, he's... What difference does it make, Martha replies as she steps inside. You'll make your life a misery, Eve says. What's left of it, you mean? Martha shrugs. What happens in here doesn't matter. It's what happens out there that does. He doesn't follow me into the cell. I wonder if Eve stops him. Can I trust her? The cell's small and cold. The walls are bright white without a single mark. There's a window high up on the outside wall with white bars across. I don't think it opens. And on the wall opposite is a white metal door. It's closed and locked now. The flap in it too. I'm like a, it's like I'm in a box. There was a fire in the corridor and roast like a chicken. In fact, everything in here was white. The bed against the wall is white, with white sheets and a white pillow. And there's a white toilet in the corner and a white sink. But that's it. No shelves, desk, table, lamp, wardrobe. Why would I need a wardrobe? Books, pens, nothing. Why would I need anything? The only thing superfluous in here is a clock, high up on the wall above the door, ticking away every second left of my life. And that's white too, with neon hands. It's totally devoid of anything, any kind of stimulus. It's like my eyes have been turned to mute or I've been stuck down with some weird colour blindness. Not where I can't tell the difference, but where there is no colour. The prison overall things they've put me on. A bright white too, and even my brown hair is gone. Shaved off in somebody's bin. I feel like I've lost half of myself. My hair was me, my clothes too. What did I expect? It's prison for Christ's sake, it's death row. It's not going to be nice, is it? It's so bright in here, it's hurting my eyes and giving me a headache. I can't tell where the light's coming from. There's no bulb dangling in the middle of the cell or strip across the ceiling. I think maybe it's coming from right at the top where the wall joins the ceiling, but are the walls glowing? Is that some kind of light emitting paint? Is this some torch they've dreamt up? I'd like to close my eyes, lie on the bed and drift away from here. But even when I close my eyes, it's still bright. Shouldn't think I'll sleep much in here, and I don't think they want me to. Torture. Yeah, I think I was right. Maybe they figured out that the best way to cope with this is to sleep the time away. They don't want you to cope, they want you to suffer. I couldn't really sleep away my final week though, could I? My last seven days of breathing and living. 
less than that now. How many hours is it? Minutes? Seconds? I don't want to know, but what else is there to do but sleep and remember? I lie down, close my eyes and pull the sheets over my head, trying to make it dark, but I'm sure it just gets brighter. Why torture me when I'm going to die anyway? I bury my head in the mattress, screw up my eyes and concentrate on the dark inside them, trying to remember you. We met in the dark, you were hiding in the shadows, just like I was, watching the street, the old cars tearing across the broken tarmac, the stench of exhaust fumes. You weren't there every evening like me. Sometimes you didn't stay very long, but I had to go there, see? Couldn't sleep till I said goodnight to her. God, I don't want to remember. I miss her. Miss you. I hate that I do. Don't want to be soft. When I picked up that gun, she was in my mind, but I didn't do it for her. I told you to go that night for everyone else who can be saved, for justice, for right. You wanted to bring down the system. At first, all I wanted was to bring down the man. Not kill him, actually, although that's how it happened, but show him for what he was. By the end of my seven days here, even those who love him at the moment will have dragged his memory off that pedestal. They put him on and my part will be done. I'll rest in peace and finally so will others. We've got our roles, me and you, defined by where we were, brought up. You can be the fighter while I can be the martyr. After all, that's a girl from the Rises. After all, that's all a girl from the Rises like me can do. I'm not clever enough, confident enough. I haven't got enough money. Had no future even before I ended up here. We thought we'd be, we thought we could be together, but that was bullshit. Love me enough to let me go.